282, uh, World War II. I want to make sure that, one, you can uh, hear me and you can see my screen. So if you could let me know by the uh, microphone or chat feature, then we'll move forward. I can hear you. Good. Excellent. You. Thank you very much. Yep, we can go ahead. All right. Two goals for today, updates and questions. And then I want to move into September 1st, 1939, the fall of France and, uh, and Dunkirk. Um, I'll get as much of that in as I can, and uh, we need to move forward. So we all know modules open on Monday, close on Saturdays, do the grading. Uh, exam one um, was completed. Uh, the grades were sent back. Overall, they were uh, very good papers. Uh, some needed some additional content uh, and evidence uh, along the way. Uh, but overall, uh, you did well on those questions. So it's important to follow the structure of what we're looking for in an essay. You got to have an introduction, a narrative body where you have evidence, details, specifics, examples. You talk about uh, you know the specific question trying to answer it, uh, providing the content that's needed with some examples along with that, and then you put a summary and conclusion together. So we're at week six now, module six, week six. The fall of France is there. Gilbert uh, reading is going to start up. I've got FDR's note in there when it's uh, William Bullitt uh, calling uh, uh, from Paris, um, relaying something from um, the our ambassador, Anthony uh, a biddle. And so, you know, Bullet is the one that calls the um, the president. And I've spent a lot of time on just that incident itself. And uh, you can take a look at the handwritten note that Roosevelt puts in there, but I'll give you the little uh, inside story of that because I'm always interested in how this happens. As you know, Roosevelt had a lot of difficulty uh, walking. So when they got him up to uh, the room here uh, that evening, uh, before he got the call, um, he left those braces uh, on his legs, and uh, he was dressed, and he, they took off his uh, jacket, and he's, uh, they lift up, he sits on the bed, they lift up the two braces, and then he's, uh, you know, laying on his back there, ready to, ready to go to sleep, and there's a lamp that's there in, a, in one of those candlestick phones. Well, close to about three o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, the light comes on, and he opens the door and they rap on the door um, and the, the door opens to turn on the light and they you know, sort of wiggle, you know, touch his shoulder there and he um, wakes up a little bit. And so then they have to move his legs over to the side and then hook the, the braces down so that he can, then they, he sits up and he's sitting there and to his right is a little uh, nightstand and the lamps there and there's the phone. So, you know, he's still trying to get, get awake like that. And his white hair is all mess, you know, messy is sticking up. I mean, he was asleep. And so in his right hand, he takes the phone, um, like the candlestick of it. And then in his left hand, he, you know, he takes the piece and holds it up to his ear. And uh, before they switch the call into him, into that room, he wants to know what, what it is. And it's uh, the people that are there. There's about three of them say, well, it's William. That's William Bullet. Who? Bill Bullet? Well, where's he calling from? Well, he's he's calling from Paris, and he, he's got a, a message to to relay. So he, I guess, himself saying, I probably took a deep breath. I don't know for sure, but uh, you would imagine. And so he said, um, and then he nods his head, and the signal goes down out to the where it is, and it the call then comes up from where that switchboard was at that time to the room that he's in. He's not on the first floor. He's up on the second floor. And so he gets into that Roosevelt and um, he says, uh, Bill, 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 is that you? Yeah, yeah, it's here. Yeah, yeah. We call him pretty early in the morning. Yeah, hey, Roosevelt here. Yes, that's right. Well, um, what, what, what is it, Bill? Yes, you, you, you've heard from uh, the ambassador yeah, to, re to relay a message. And then... These are people watching Roosevelt. Um, he's listening. And what Bill tells him, he called him Bill, was that the Anthony Biddle had relayed to him uh, that Germany had invaded Poland. And so he listens to that. And then he slumps forward a little bit. And his left hand in that earpiece goes down 
and then the phone just kind of goes down. I don't know, maybe 15 seconds or so. And then he looks up at the people in the room. And uh, I don't know if Bill was talking or not, but then Roosevelt gets himself, left hand comes up to his ear, the, the mouthpiece comes over, and he said to him, it's come at last, Bill. God help us all. And he puts his arms out, tells them to take the phone and get him up. And from that moment until the day he died, he focused on that war. You know, whoever you want to read, no one will convince me that, you know, he was worrying about, you know, doing other things. Well, that's true. But until his last breath in Warm Springs, Georgia, he focused on that war and and what was happening, even though we weren't in it yet. He he knew what was coming. Uh, and that, that's just a great, you can read a little bit of that handwritten note. I think he wrote that afterwards. I'm not sure there's a different time on it, but I wanted you to see it because it's an important part of how he has to overcome adversity physically, and then he has to deal with all that's going on and uh, Churchill will be leaning on him right away, you know, to come into the war, you got to help us, you got to do all that. And so whatever you read about Roosevelt and his position in the war, these little vignettes give you, boy, he just wanted to get up out of that bed and get himself right on there. And he was on the phone to Churchill, I'm sure, right away as to what was going on and getting more reports like that. So that you can see the letter. I pulled it up out of the National Archives. I've got the audio. I got that BBC broadcast for you. I've got a good C-SPAN media. You should watch that. All right. Reflection paper six is due this week. And the goal for you here is you might want to look back in the guidelines for writing the reflection paper to make sure you kind of cover the questions. Uh, I've noticed not a whole lot, but there's a little bit of drift here uh, away from. I want you to focus on those questions. Uh, your paper has been outstanding. The, this group and the um, my Civil War class, both of those reflections. Uh, uh, I don't have that in the other classes, but I have them in these two, and they're just a joy to read uh, and how you, you write them. So there's a lot going for you there. All right, so keep that up. Research. Uh, uh, is, is moving along, uh, submarines, B-17s, World War II letters, and remember we have question uh, three is going to be uh, due next Friday, so go through the list of questions, look at question three, what question is that for you, whether you're working with a submarine, whether you're working with a B-17, or you're working with a, um, a World War II letter home, those are, are pretty critical. All right, so that's coming up on March 5th. To find materials, I put a link in there for the submarines. It's better to go to the the National Archives site that actually has the typed copies of the tape patrol reports, and then they also have the logs of the submarines. All submarines have logs where the captain has to sign off on the log as to what they do. I mean, it's it's not just let's run the submarine. Well, it is, but then you have log books. They have a lot of paperwork they have to do, and uh, they generally do it. Good. Yeah, that, that's excellent how, how it works. So you're going to do, you pick one of the three. Uh, sure, glad to help you on that. You pick one of the three, and then you look at the questions. Uh, I have those uh, in the syllabus, and then you look at the due dates for each one uh, under assignments. It'll all be there for you. So you turn them in, I look at them, and then eventually I give you a temporary mark. And then week 14, you turn in, if you want, a draft of everything. I'll, I'll read through it, make sure that it's, the level it needs to be at. If it's not, I'll tell you, you need to do some more work. You do or make revisions week 15, you turn them in week 16, uh, which is the last day is May 21st, uh, uh, Friday instead of Saturday, because that's when it all, Blackboard turns itself off at 1159. And then I'll spend the weekend grading it and turn in the marks on Monday. That's generally a uh, timetable. But the idea is you want to look for their service records. Everyone that's in the military has got, got a service record, got a, got an ID, a serial number, a dog tag number, and, and you can find some very, some good information about that individual. If you know what state they're from, uh, their state records, if you know what town, you can look in newspapers for that year, especially somebody that's a submarine captain is going to get a lot of notoriety. Uh, later in the war, especially after the war. They're not going to advertise who they are during the war because that puts a lot of families at risk because we've got 
you know, saboteurs and agents working in this country that go after individual families. And there's a nice history of that and some good literature that you can read about it. People don't really look into that, but, you know, you don't want to advertise, you know, when all these heroes come back during the war and uh, we put them on bond drives, we also have to protect their families because after they're gone, those individuals are, are going to target their families. So they're going to, they'll need security as well. It's just not, oh, this is great. Uh, and uh, we get all this notoriety. And as soon as they leave, uh, the government's got to step in and the local police and protect these family members because things, things do happen. Uh, I won't have time to get into all of those uh, in, in the course that we have here, but at least uh, you get a good indication of uh, what's happening. Everyone thinks we know everything about all of these wars and, and what goes on, and we really don't. Uh, the home front is a tough front, just like the other. And the longest battle is the Battle of the Atlantic. So we're not looking at, we're looking at subs in the Pacific. And there's a lot out there on, on the fleet command and things that if you run into difficulty uh you can uh, get into the national archives site nara nara and email look look under world war ii records and documents and you can email them about you know specifics about the, the submarine i mean you can find when it was commissioned when it was scrapped a lot of them were scrapped in the 60s um and that's brought back uh, the same way with the planes a lot of them were scrapped uh uh some of them, for very few of them left now, the B-17s, um, they just recycled, scrapped a lot of them. Um, they saved a few, but sometimes not enough. All right, so let me stop with that because I want to get into the content for today. What questions do you have over anything uh, that we're working on, anything that uh, I've covered, anything on your research, anything at all? All right, if anything comes up, just uh, interrupt. Say, Professor Harkins, I have a question. I'll stop. Send me an email. If you want to be in and collaborate, we can do that as well. All right, so up today, we know what happened. September 1st, 1939, Germany uh, invades Poland. She'd been working on that for a while, um, and now World War II um, is official. September 1st, 1939, four days after the attack in a Reichstag speech, um, the German uh, leader uh, gives this uh, speech uh, four days after the attack. And um, what's happening if you were in Berlin and you were out on the streets and you heard all um, speakers up by the, uh, the light poles and things, uh, the streets in Berlin were not very well populated. No, they just weren't. And is if Poland refused to discuss German demands, which is erroneous. Uh, I've spent time over the last few years looking at a lot of this right up to it, and I wish I had the time to share all that, but um, the evening before the attack, Poland sent out, the Polish government sent out a communique to almost every country in the world saying, was there anyone that's going to help us because we believe we're going to be attacked within so many hours. We got one too. We didn't do anything. Nobody did anything. France will have a little ray across into Germany and then turn around and come back. Um, yeah, and I believe there was a non-aggression pact between Germany and Poland. All those do is all these, uh, these uh, non-aggression pacts, these armistices and things like that. You, you can study them and talk about them, but all they do is buy time until one of the two decides to move when it's in their best interest. So a part of the excuse is, is that Poland attacked uh, Germany first. Uh, the Germans uh, captured uh, some Polish soldiers, dressed them up in uh, German uniforms, sent them in some German buildings, shot them, and then took pictures. And this happened uh, in, in more than one location uh, on the border and said, look at what they did without ever showing you uh, the faces uh, that took place. So th there's a lot of that that had come out over the years as to how this was uh, how this was set up. So I'm going to go through some of it for you today. They violated the German frontier. That's the story that I gave you. Most of the pictures that uh, Germany put out to the world and in their newspapers were all posed pictures like that. And they had 
taking care of every detail to make sure that the world would believe them that, uh, you know, these uh, um, German soldiers at the border were just attacked by uh, by Polish troops and Germany has got to respond. Uh, you know, we're, we're under siege. We're being attacked and, and nobody's there to help uh, you know, a Germany, that uh, uh, the Polish aggression. So you'll read those stories. You see, this is all part of what uh, they're putting out there. The pact with the USSR, the Soviet Union, excludes the use of force between our countries for all times to come. Hmm. Yeah. We will never demand anything else from the West more appeasement. You've done some work on that, so you hear that. That's all we wanted. Well, you go back the previous year, you go all the way back to 1933, and it's all this appeasement, 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 and all the steps to war that are there. Poland will be finished, and we will have a great peace. These are translations from the German speech uh, and speeches that were prepared for um, as soon as the attack starts, and then what happens on the second day and the third day, all of this moves forward. The goal is to keep uh, Britain neutral uh, so that we can move to the east. Well, remember, part of that strategy was well, we're going to strike in the west and then we're going to go to the east. And all of a sudden now we're going to strike in the east. And so there's this back and forth issue. You look at that in the German records that are there and the decisions that they made is uh, they, they want to move through uh, Poland. They want an eye on uh, the Soviet Union as, as part of it, the Bolsheviks. Okay. So uh, the argument that's put forth in 1936 to 39 is the German people want more territory. They want more land. Is that really true? Do the German people want more territory, more land? They're not very good. Uh, you know, they're average at best in agricultural production. Where Germany really, really soars is the production, industrial production, metallurgies. And so the surrounding states around Germany, especially uh, in the Balkans and in Poland and Austria, uh, the agriculture production is so far superior to Germans. However, they sell Germany the food sources and the, the fruits, the vegetables, all those kinds of things. And Germany sells all of the, the pots and pans and plow the iron metal work because they're they're very good at machinists. So there's a for a long time there was this positive relationship in trade. However, it comes to the point where German people want more land and more territory because they're not very productive per acre. They, they, they should and, and that's they, they had fallen behind on that for quite a while. Part of it is the soil in the northern part of Germany is sandy. They got but they can grow other things in kind of semi sandy soil. So they're not really focusing. They're just heavy into industrialization. And last week I gave you a lot of that as well. By late thirty nine, they were moving away from territorial expansion and war. Okay. Remember, I gave you one of the newer kind of views as to why they went to war, because they went to war because there was just about ready to be an internal explosion with the German population. Now, that's yet to be a lot of individuals are talking about that, working on that as well. Well, some of the data that comes up in 1939 is that a lot of the German people didn't want territorial expansion and they definitely didn't want a war. Not all of them, but a good number. So we're wondering, all right, well, how did we get a war? Well, we attacked, they attacked Poland and the war starts. And from there it's, it's right? And so these are some views uh, that are out there, okay? The idea that days of popular wars are over. So the in, in a number of German cities, uh, they took note of that, of how many people went out and cheered as they did in World War I. Certain German cities they did, other German cities they didn't telltale sign of support. Those came back to our government because we had we had representatives in Berlin, we had them in Paris, we had them in Poland, other governments do. And the report comes back and you can read them is that there was no hue and cry on the streets uh, supporting us. So how much of it was a surprise to the German people? Okay, And then what uh, appears is Blitzkrieg and everybody talks about it, but uh, I'm going to spend a little time on it because there's many parts to it. It's just not lightning war it's there's a there's a method to doing it and it works well in short distances and short defined territory uh, when you're close to your supply lines and you can get them there very quickly well how does it work and i'll next exam i'll have an exam question while i'll ask you to, to explain how it works well it involves these different elements and and one part of it uh, is how it is going to be a heavy tanks okay all of a sudden, everything that they were preparing for ahead of time 
So we're going to go out first with heavy tanks. We're going to cross the border. All right. And, and then what comes in after heavy tanks or, or medium tanks? All right. And then when these tanks are heading in, heavy tanks, medium tanks, um, you, they, there's communication with the air. And the air sees what's happening so they can direct the uh, medium tanks and the heavy tanks in different directions. Tremendous uh, ground to air, air to ground communication. Now, uh, five, six years before all this happened, uh, Germans were placed in uh, different Polish towns, different Polish communities, uh, in the government, in civilian work, all of that. And I can, I'll give you one example, because in the letters, I have quite a number of translated letters. I have original copies of them in, in Polish as well. And so Poland was preparing for that. They had uniforms in a certain place. They had uh, rifles. They had all of that. So when this invasion starts, the Polish government just moves right into action. They're, you know, they've got things ready to go as well. They were assuming things uh, as they got close here. You know, June, July, August, and then uh, the end of August, they knew that things that could happen or would possibly happen, and that uh, the French wouldn't be as active as they should. And so they were they were ready. But what happened is they didn't realize that within their ranks they had some individuals who had been, uh, you know, sort of moved into Poland from uh, Germany. And so when the time came, you got the phone call, you headed off to go down to this location so that you could get your, um, you know, begin the, the process of getting into your, your, your regiment, your, com your unit, whatever it was. So you showed up at this location and uh, it was the wrong location. They were handing out bicycles. So I said, well, that's odd. So there was another five or 600 people there getting bicycles. Hey, you didn't need a bicycle. Well, then you go to this other one and you were supposed to get something there uh, and they had canteens. So what happened is there's massive miscommunications that were taking place prior to and right up to that invasion. That's all part of Blitzkrieg that takes place. And all of where the planes were hidden, uh, the Polish Air Force planes, those were all communicated. The German Air Force went in and destroyed those. They knew exactly where they were. And they had, that's all called, of in, that's infiltration. There were individuals there. Well, Polish troops and government thought there'd be some of that. So they had backup systems. So these couple thousand people waiting for, you know, intake were directed somewhere else, but you still lose a little bit of time. So you you knew some of that was happening and they picked it up. So there's good intelligence, but the Germans are coming pretty quickly here. So heavy tanks, medium tanks, and then what we have is mop up. You know, these are people that come through. Um, and if there's any resistance, um, they'll mop it up and then keep on going. And then the next group that comes in are called rifle brigades, right? Uh, these are, you know, like uh, a company of, of, of soldiers. Uh, you know, like we would break them down a company platoons. Well, the Germans had that all set up. So those uh, uh, rifle brigades would come through and they'd keep moving. And then if something else came up and they ran into some uh, difficulty, there'd be trench mortars that uh, would be uh, into place uh, to, as the tanks kept going, to take care of buildings or little outposts where there seems to be some resistance. Rifle brigades would communicate it back. The mortars would come up surround the area and then just pound it with mortars until it was either eliminated or until they surrendered. Okay. Then they had a rear section that came up. Uh, and these were people, um, we know a little, we know a lot about them. Um, they had civilian uniforms on, uh, who they reported to, I couldn't tell you. And they just eliminated anybody that was left. They killed them. Uh, often referred to as rear sections, civilian uniforms. Uh, the civilian clothing, uh, hats, jacket, coats, they didn't have any military markings on them. Later, the Russians will adopt the same thing. The only difference is the Russians will have a red star on a hat or one red star. Until later in the war, they even did away from that because the Germans would go after anybody that had a red star. Okay, All under the protection of what is the German Air Corps coming over. All right. So Germany had what in Blitzkrieg? They knew what position. When all this is happening, what comes? What what else is going on? 
as soon as those tanks start out, they're already in the air. Paratroopers, German paratroopers behind the lines. They have them. They're parachuting behind the lines outside of cities, getting themselves all lined up, ready to go to reunite with the heavy tanks and everything else that came through there. Okay. And paratroopers, air to ground communications and support. Paratroopers got into any difficulty, boom, uh, in would come uh, German planes, uh, fighters, bombers, you name it. They, they had them all set up. This is a very planned out operation. So what happened on September 1st, 1939 was, well, let's just not uh, have some tanks invade Poland. All set up, all targeted down to the last detail. That's how sophisticated um, the attack was. And Poland was ready to a point. Well, what happened then is the the Germans set up, they're going to strike at all the, the Polish strong strong points first where their tanks were, where their resources were, where their military was. They're going to do that. And then after this goes on for a few days, the German Air Corps was then turned loose to bomb at will. So no commands. They turned them loose. This is part of what you come out of World War I with. You say, well, they didn't have planes in World War I. Well, they did. But what happened is, is that um, as late in World War I, the German units were turned loose to move on their own based on their local leaders, they're like their lieutenants and captains. They turned the German Air Corps uh, loose after so many days. They could come back, refuel, get whatever explosives they needed, and they would decide where they're going to go next. Now, that doesn't come out a lot, but see, that's an important part of what goes on in Blitzkrieg. Because if it's a time, you have to go back and wait, and you know it's all this you know, uh, control and, pre, and, and pre-programming. That's for a few days, and then they turn them loose. And so where did they go? They bombed Warsaw 37 times in one week. That's where they went. Right. Okay. So for some reason, boy, they're, they're going after Warsaw. And those pilots that were there and their wing commanders and everybody else in the Luftwaffe, you know, when they came back and refueled and got all that, uh, it was sort of, you know, at will where you're going to go. This is all part of Blitzkrieg. So it's not an idea. Well, we think they're going to go here next and there next, or we're going to have a bombing run to this city or this part of the country. You know, they were just all over the place. And when that happens, you don't know how to defend against it. That's, that's an issue. Then they had what are called fifth column uh, behind the scenes again, uh, working against uh, the Polish government and the Polish people. The, uh, the 10th German army was outside of Warsaw by uh, September 8th. They were stopped. So September 1st to the 10th, they were stopped, right? And who's handling it? Polish civilians are there, Polish military are there, Poland's gonna fight it out you know, and they're ready. If you read some of the German um, reports, uh, because they, they wrote them as well, the German officers and others, and you, if you look hard enough, you can find them. Uh, they were taken back at the resistance that they uh, encountered uh, from the Polish uh, defenders. Now, the agreement was with uh, Stalin that he would come in almost two weeks later. Uh, because Germany is moving so quickly, and and Stalin is just kind of taken back by this blitzkrieg. Part of this blitzkrieg was also to uh, get Stalin's attention because he saw it. And he felt that uh, he can't wait two weeks. He came early because he was fearful that Germany was going to overrun all of Poland. And where are they going to go next? Right. Yeah, he knew. And I gave you some of that data last week is that, you know, of all the countries in that that 36 to 39 period of time, Stalin put more of his country's GNP and economic punch. It was, it was as high as 30 percent more than anybody else. So what did he know? Well, he knew that non-aggression pacts only last so long. It just who's I believe that. But, you know, you can look at the literature as well. So, so now Germany's in a war. And what it is, by September 14th, they're going to cut Warsaw off from the rest of the country. All right. And then what happens is uh, Germany <laughs> is, is moving and Russia's wondering, like, will they stop? 
And so Russia invades early. Mm -hmm. And now Poland's got a two front war. It's like, well, wait, wait, we had these non-aggression pacts. What, what, what's happening here? What's the communication? Why, why are the Russians doing this? Uh, and the, the only excuse is that, well, there's Russians that have been in Polish territory and they've been mistreated. And it's, those aren't, it, it's not even close to an excuse. They don't have any reason. Uh, all that evidence doesn't hold up, but they have to put something out. And we're really, uh, Britain, everybody else, because the uh, Europe's going to declare war here uh, very, very quickly as soon as September 1st hits and all of this, you know, they all fall into line and the United States sits out, but we're getting all the communications as well that take place. So why did the Russian invade? Okay. Well, they wanted uh, what? They wanted, uh, they're part of Poland. They didn't want uh, uh, Germany on their border. And during this whole time on the border, uh, Russian and Polish officers generally got along. Um, you can read that. It's, it's, it's a little different view than oftentimes is there, is that, um, you know, some of these Russians were in Russia, but they were of Polish descent, and some of the, the Polish officers were, you know, of Russian descent. So there's, these are border peoples. And for a long period of time, there's always, uh, it wasn't as, even though the government's hostile, uh, the people... Uh, in many cases, weren't. But when the war starts, and then it's like, okay, this is it. There's a war now, so you're on one side or the other. And so things really pick up for us here, okay? September 26, Warsaw is attacked. Polish government asked for an armistice on the afternoon of the 26th. And what they're going to do is the Germans are going to hold on that. And on October 1st, 1939, the German 10th Division enters Warsaw. I have a lot of different slides of of that, and I've had students in class uh, uh, ha with with relatives that were, were involved in this, and we've shared some wonderful pictures of of what was happening uh, in some of the, uh, the the quad areas of Warsaw, and what's going to come out of it is the um, the creation of a. Uh, uh, a sort of a Warsaw duchy that's going to be created and the same concept is going to be used in uh, Vichy, France. And so now Warsaw uh, falls. And uh, what was the German discussion before Poland? Well, it was whether to, whether to attack in the east-west. So I got down to what I covered last week, see, that was a big component, what I went into. Those are resources, and they're very important when you get the strategic people to sit down and figure them out, is, okay, what do we need, and where can we get it? And all the negotiation in 38, where Germany was trying to create Poland as a satellite, and Poland would have nothing to do with that, even offered to provide some German support and at Danzig, they said they didn't like the way the Versailles Treaty came out. We didn't plan at all. Well, Germany says, well, we didn't plan at all either. So if you read that, you can get a perspective of what these two countries are talking about. And Poland lets it be known that we are independent and we don't want to have anything to do with satellite situations. If you want the resources and food and things, you can buy them and trade for them like anybody else. Now, that's kind of a generalization. You got to look at all the, the evidence that's there. And, and when you see it, it's, it's overwhelming as to what's going on here. And that doesn't come out. There's an economic side of it. So where is Germany going to go? East. Why? To ensure the food supply. Because that goes back to what was going to happen in 1939. They were almost, Germany was almost forced to attack because there was going to be uh, some upheavals. And they don't like talking about that. Even in their own courses, they, you know, what were these German people doing? Well, four days after when those speeches are given, a lot of them are coming out of their homes. That tells you they're unhappy about something, right? To ensure the food supply, okay? If the West challenges us, it will be a fight to the death. The West. And we're talking about the, that means France, England, Belgium, the West. Okay. Wow. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Forces were left in the West to protect against the attack. Now, when all this is going on, you know what Berlin's really concerned about? What's happening in the West. When the communications come in, and if you have time, you can look it up. And uh, finally, they, they, it's been written about uh, it takes time, but you know, people get into that. Is that there's more concern, phone calls, tele, you know, 
telegraph communications going from what's happening in the West, then the East is launched. It'll do what it is. Now we got to watch over here to make sure that we're not attacked because if we are, then we've got to begin a movement. And in the fourth, we're left in the West. We're, we're, we're meager, but they were there. And France probably could have overcome them, but she makes a quick foray in there and then determines this isn't good for us. And so basically uh, she abandons Poland. And so does the rest of the world. This is an attack. She's asking for help. Where, where is the help? There were others in those countries that wanted to help, but they couldn't get their government to move. So we've got to send troops. We've got to do this, 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 and this, and the government just sat quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Germany lacks natural resources. There's more natural resources in the West than there is in the East. We talked about those natural resources. So what the Greater Reich was trying to do was to round up all these resources so that they could avoid what problems they faced it before, during, and after World War I, which was all those blockades, and they ran out of food. They're going to run out of food and resources anyway. I mean, they'll come up with wonderful technology, coal gasification, squeezing coal to create gasoline. The Russians will use potatoes to do that, and so will um, the Japanese will use sunflower seeds. They'll come up with all their creativity, but none of that is enough to propel what's needed in a huge war machine. Okay, Had to import iron from Sweden. Why did why did Germany move to up to those uh, Scandinavian countries? She needed iron ore to keep those furnaces moving. So if they would have sat down and looked at all this, all these European countries uh, since uh, you know, from uh, 1900 on up, they would have realized that none of them would have had the necessary resources to sustain anything. Japanese knew that. They knew that they had about 24 months to do what they needed to do, and then they'd run out of supplies, run out of materials, right? Okay. Germany had to import massive amounts of food because the food producers, the average as they were, weren't going to be able to do that because they're going to be pushed into the, the military. That's all part of that you know, community-mindedness. You see that term. You know, people see that, and you know, all these ter terms are extremely important as to what they mean because they hide things. You know, people say, oh, community-mindedness, that's wonderful. In Germany at the time, it's not wonderful. No, no. It's worse than indoctrination. Tires and fuels were lacking to run the war machine. Couldn't do it. Italy is worse off. Okay. Yeah. Germany, instead of rearming the Navy, closer with those submarines in World War I than she ever was in World War II, you know what she does? She <laughs> neglected the Navy. Neglected them. Okay. But tried the, to handle the the Atlantic and couldn't. I think down the road, I'm going to get those uh, those Atlantic submarines in there, our submarine fleet in the Atlantic. But I thought for this, we'd, we'd start with the Pacific because Pacific doesn't really get as much attention uh, um, in dealing with submarines, uh, but they're there. So neglected. Admiral Rader was unable to catch up. If you look at the German high command when those meetings took place, um, Raider and the rest of them read what they wrote in World War One, and they said, "Yeah, you know, they told the Kaiser that there wouldn't be a, a, a there wouldn't be one foot of any Canadian, anybody from the U.S. landing on the continent of Europe, because the German submarines will take care of them." And they they wrote after the war, "Why were, were we mistaken?" Raider, the rest of them understood that. They kept telling them, "We won't be able to catch up." The German Navy. And that hurt them in North Africa because Mussolini couldn't get all of the supplies over uh, to North Africa to save the Africa Corps uh, because the British and we were there would literally, they're all on the bottom of the Mediterranean loaded with all kinds of supplies and materials that uh, that's, that's what happens. The Africa Corps, they all surrendered. They, they surrendered. I mean, they, they ran out of ammunition. They were throwing rocks. Hey, they, it was over. They couldn't get that. So where, where was the German Navy in the Mediterranean? Where was the German Air Force in the Mediterranean? Well, the German Navy wasn't there. The Air Force was worried about what? Yes, the Russian front. Okay. So where does the German Navy start? 1939. Not going to make it. Nope. They made a strategic decision. You make those. 
wherever you are in these wars. They're either going to make a strategic calculation or it's going to be a strategic miscalculation. And so the miscalculation was favoring air power instead of maybe an even-handed approach, thinking air, air power could do it. And I guarantee air power didn't do it. No. No. Why is that? Well, the blitz, they couldn't even match the RAF. It was real close, but a lot of difficulty. It takes a lot to get those planes moving, repair. Uh, uh, it's just a whole, whole story in that. So they move, you know, to me, it was a miscalculation. They fa favored air power, and that's what they're going to go with, and that's what they're going to lose with, right? Okay. Raider is unable to destroy Britain's commercial shipping. That's the problem, you see? As long as that commercial shipping is coming and they can get up out of the Suez, right? Germany got within 50, I think a little closer at uh, Trebrook and Al Alamein. What a battle. Got within 50, 40 miles of the canal and the British fought them. These are the British that left at Dunkirk. They had to come back. They fought them at that canal. What a, what a battle. Right, you can go to the cave area and see where Ronald's name is still carved in those caves where they stayed. So Raider couldn't destroy Britain's commercial shipping. That's a big miscalculation. And if you can't control Britain's commercial shipping, you know what's going to happen. Resupply. Donitz required 1,000 subs when the war broke out. He didn't even have 100 third of them were in repair, one third of them were sailing out into the Atlantic, one third of them were on their way back to get into repair. A thousand subs is not going to be there for him. That's what he told them that he needed. And, you know, I don't know what the discussion was, but I, I read his statement that he, you know, he basically very seriously told the German high command that uh, before any war breaks out, we're going to need 1,000 submarines. And then they just kept talking. He knew. Mm -hmm. What happened to the Polish-German non-aggression pact of uh, uh, 1934 that was supposed to last 10 years? Most people don't even know there was one. What happened? The key year in history is 1933. That's when everything changes, and nobody talks much about it. You know, they talk about 1939, and all the things happen, but everything goes back to 33. That's the that's the key where it moves in one direction. And six years later, you see what happens. 74 German divisions invaded Poland and they fought them. Ugh. But what a, what battles. Uh, one of these days I'd like to just do uh, the whole Eastern Front and start here with Poland and get into the, the battles and, and where the Polish soldiers fought and where the civilians fought like that. Um, so if you have some time, you can look into it uh, a little bit. The numbers, uh, the Germans never really report numbers. They do, but the numbers are never accurate. They never tell you uh, the truth um, uh, that takes place. Um, we know that uh, there were you know, probably close to 700,000 uh, Polish prisoners that were taken. Uh, and, and some of that is accurate that we can... Uh, we can get those numbers because uh, Poland was pretty accurate in, in recording them. And what we end up with is the fourth partition of, of Poland. And so Poland let the rest of the world know what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there's, a, there's an armistice. Warsaw falls. But from that day until the end of the war, and even today, this is what the the Polish people carry for your freedom and ours. That's right. They withstood the unleashing of this blitzkrieg uh, without help from the outside. They understood their ground, and you'll see what happens uh, when the generals head to Britain, and, and, and I'll get into that a little more down the road. There's just a lot there. All right, let me move uh, quickly over. I have enough time. I want to do uh, a France uh, for you as to what happens. Um, and uh, I can do a little bit on Dunkirk as well um, as to the 
uh, problems that take place. Um, let's see if we can do a little bit on that for us today. Okay. Yep. Okay. So that's 1939, September. And all of a sudden, we're rolling into what? 1940. And what is it? It's called. It's called the the phony war. But the the, the French called it the. It's the funny. It's phony. It's a phony war. In other words, they believe that uh, it's going to be like War One. We got the marginal line. We're going to send troops up to Belgium, and we know the Germans are going to invade there. And we'll, this is going to be a replay of World War One, and we'll beat them. You know, we got the line. We've got the the British. All of them declare war on Germany after the invasion of Poland. They want everything stopped. The communications are break breaks off. I can give you all the dates. You can look them up as well. And then all of a sudden, the weather's so bad. And the German high command had, had at least given the order at least four times to invade France and had to call it off because of the weather. All right. So what happens? Okay. French cabinet members are alarmed that something's going to happen. Okay. And when the invasion does come, uh, Renault promised Churchill that France would stay in the fight. Right. Yeah, I don't think so. Unable to deliver, he resigns. New president of France comes in is Marshal Pétain, hero of World War I, when even when the French mutinies uh, were coming. All right? So, and there's a lot of stories as to what happened to the previous uh, president, uh, premier. And so now the new premier is Marshal Pétain, but he's surrounded by traitors. Okay? That's right. And so France is going to fight on. As what happens is Germany is going to break through in the Ardennes. Uh, von Manstein comes up with the plan. German high command thinks it's it's impossible. He convinces Hitler that this is going to work. They're not going to expect it. They've got a bunch of um, new recruits, you know, like cadets guarding the northern part of the marginal line. We can get our armor through there. We'll split them in two, wrap them up, get to the sea, and the war will be over, and we'll invade then Britain. So he has to convince them, convince them, convince them uh, of the plan. And this is when they get the ideas that, you know, these people that are in the command coming out of World War One don't understand tactics. They don't understand anything. So this is the von Manstein plan, right? But Germany wanted to enslave France. Okay. And all this is going on, Winston Churchill proposes a union. Let's have France and Britain join together, so that way it'll give you some additional strength. So actually, Churchill flies there, talks to them all about that, and they're not interested in that. Um, Britain had drifted away from them, working with Japan and Germany and all that, and Germany had been, been trying to get Britain to be neutral, and now they've declared war. There's a war going on, and Germany is going to move very quickly uh, and cut off. Uh, the troops and wrap them up, and uh, the marginal line will not do anything for them. Okay, half of France is overrun when the panthers come, when the tanks come through, and who's leading it all? Rommel's there, uh, key uh, Hans Guderian, um, these great tank commanders. So the idea is speed. They use that same idea of blitzkrieg that I just described to you here as well. Okay. But the French Empire, remember, empire stands ready to fight. Well, what do we mean? Well, we're going to bring in troops from all the colonial areas. By the time they get there, the war will be over, at least it'll be over for France, because France is only going to last uh, uh, basically through the summer of 1940. So that phony war is a, a longer period. All right. Pétain ordered France then to continue to fight. Okay. And what happens? People fleeing to Spain. They're leaving leaving because they know that uh, Spain being fascist with Franco then you got Portugal that Germany will leave it alone so they want to get across the border and they're going to get out so what are they doing jamming up the roads doing the same thing that the Belgian people did during World War One and even the French did it on their way to Bordeaux during World War One Germany's aware of that so they know that the French troops have going to have a very difficult time getting anywhere and they won't be able to get on the rail lines because people are fleeing taking whatever personal possessions they can 
and it never works out. Half of them, what they take along is abandoned, destroyed along the road, and it's just uh, panic, chaos sets in like that. Churchill went directly to the French people mm -hmm. and told them they've got to stand. They've got to stay. The civilians, you got to fight. The military, he's very impassioned about this. But what he then says is that if you don't, your future is doomed. So he turns to the French military, and uh, they like what Churchill said. And so they go to London. Yes, wouldn't you? Well, of course, that's an idea. Uh, the Prime Minister Churchill's got the idea. We'll head, to, we'll head to London. We'll take our families, too. So you see this. And the Germans pick up on it right away. They've got spies. They know exactly what's going on. It's all this chaos, and that's what they want to see. Okay, Peace terms decided by Germany and Italy in Munich. Italy's there, and then they're transmitted to Paris. You see, this is what's going to happen, the peace terms. Already they're talking about them. And Mussolini's there, French. Uh, I'm sure, I don't know if Siano is there yet or not. He might be. That's Mussolini's son-in-law. And what Siano writes, if you, if you really want to know what these leaders were like in World War II, the key leaders of this war, other than um, Roosevelt and some of ours, you have to read Siano's diary and his because he describes them to a T. And you can find that online. Uh, he marries Mussolini's daughter, and uh, you, you'll see nothing like it. That is the best source. You can watch him on film. You can read with others, right? But he met with them up close, talked to them uh, outside of these meetings. So you know how people are. They go to a meeting, and you know, they, they present this persona, and you think well, what, what they're really like. Well, that's how they are in private, too. But he... Uh, Oh, boy. I used that uh, last spring, Siano's work, and the students, a few of them got it, and they said, boy, you were really right on that. I had not idea. I said, well, you share that with others. Yeah, Siano. Okay. June 18th, De Gaulle from London. France has lost the battle, but not the war. So this is the end. It's coming. French government orders De Gaulle home. <laughs> He's not going home. No, he ignored them. So he's sort of on the outs, but he's going to become this idea, you know, the free French, the French underground is going to operate in the northern part of France, and the southern part is going to be Vichy. They'll have an armistice army, a large army, and what that army will do uh, is begin moving against individuals of the Jewish faith and taking them into concentration camps. This is part of what the French army, the, that, that they're fascist in the southern part of France. Um, and you can read a little on that as well. Italy, France will never be permitted to rise again. Italians pretty negative, uh, the, the fascists uh, against uh, France. A lot of struggles on their northern borders. Lots of issues they've had in the last 40, 50 years. They don't like each other. No. Keitel read the preamble to the 30-page armistice document, and he read it in German. There'd be no talking in French when you sign these documents. That's the, the, the replay of what they had to do in World War I, uh, where they had to speak everything in French. So it's the 30-page armistice document that takes place. June 23rd, Churchill received news of the fall of France. But the French even wrote that they fought better when the British went home. Um, so they didn't really get along. I won't have time for Dunkirk, but I'm going to do Dunkirk because I spent a lot of time on it like that. I know there was a movie. I'd have read uh, some of the script of it, but it's uh, – Chase spent a lot of time going into reading uh, the writings of many of the people that were at Dunkirk to see what happens there. It, it's, it's powerful uh, as to what was going on and the role of uh, Churchill – the monarchy, and of course, Lord Halifax, uh, British, okay, supposedly talking to Mussolini. Okay, De Gaulle demanded the French fight on. He goes on the radio in the air and he gives it, he says, you know, that France is can never be defeated. And so the French government demoted him. You know, you're instigating trouble. We're going to have an armistice with Germany and life will go on, right? And not for De Gaulle, no. British response. Uh, we're no longer going to recognize the French government. You're done. You're out. That's it. Okay? That's what they said. 
And so now the this Vichy government in the southern part of France is none other than they're looked upon as collaborators. But they saved the French fleet for a while. Uh, they have a French army, and uh, it's got a job that it's working on, and it's going to get some of those young French uh, fascists and socialists to grow some crops and produce food and do a lot of that for the German war machine because they need that. In the northern part of France, I mean, the climate's a little different. They can grow certain things, and they do have dairy products and things like that. But that's what we're going to have. The German army is going to occupy that because we need subpens. And we're going to keep a good eye on Britain because they're next. That's where the next invasion is going to come from. All right. Churchill. Uh, France was betrayed by collaborators. And they were working. This plan of collaboration was set up uh, ahead of time. There's fascists talking to fascists. They had infiltrated that's nothing that just came up with the spur of the moment. The plan is working. They split France in half. That's what they wanted to do. Race to the sea. And the whole British army, the British expeditionary force that was created, uh, the second one after World War II, and they got closer and new members came in, basically trapped uh, at Dunkirk. And there's no way to get them off except the little boats. Okay. At 12.35 a.m. on June 24th, 1940, the Battle of France is over. Yeah. Occasionally when I would go to France years back, I'd, you know, go over from England to, you know, took the boat over. I didn't like those hovercrafts and the channel and all that. And I made sure I got to Paris on June 24th just to see if there was anything. And no, they don't like to talk about it. Not that I cause any difficulty or anything. I just wanted to see if they uh, did anything on that day. And they didn't do anything on that day. Uh, a couple of times I was there. Um, and I can see why. Yeah. And before Renault resigned, he called FDR and said, I need FDR. I said, well, what's happening? And I could give you the story. We've got a, a minute or two. I won't give you the whole story. I won't act it out. But he, um, you know, Roosevelt said, well, what's happening? And he tells them, you know, they could hear things overhead and things like that. And he says, We're, it's all the war, the war is lost. He says, I told your ambassador that we needed help like that. And FDR says, how can we help you? I want clouds and clouds and clouds of planes. And FDR says, well, you know, we're, we're not at war. I Maybe I could lend a lease like that. And Renault just is like, uh, he needs thousands and thousands of planes to stop him. And I've always looked to see if there's a transcript that if if Roosevelt uh, took that down because I know he taped he taped a lot of his meetings in the Oval Office and his in the White House as well. Um, most a lot of presidents did because they they wanted to make sure that the right evidence and material was presented. But I, I don't I've never seen one on this. I've only read it uh, of what uh, he said. FDR responded, "We are doing everything possible. That's all we can do. Yeah, can't do any more." U.S. could not enter the war without an act of Congress. See, they they thought in Churchill calling, saying, "You got to get into the war." You know, you know, France is falling. We're next, and 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 what are you going to do? And he says, "We well, can't do anything without the act, without an act of Congress. We're a peace-loving country. We haven't been attacked. You know, we can kind of help where we can. You know, moral help and arsenal of democracy and things of that nature. But we just don't declare war on on certain countries." Um, and Churchill didn't like that. Neither did the French premier. On the 14th, Paris fell. Dunkirk. What a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, hang on, I'll just give you one slide on Dunkirk. Um, and I'll have to save that story for next week. Dunkirk. Yeah, what a story. Well, it is one o'clock and I don't have time to do that. So next week, um, if you check our syllabus and where we're moving along here, um, the London Blitz, the RAF, uh, I'll start with Dunkirk you know, because the RAF is going to lose some planes here. Uh, and I'm going to give you a, a, what we think was going on at Dunkirk. And you may know it already, but I want to get into it in some detail. So that's about all that I, I wanted to do for today. Um, you take a whole course just on all of France and the individual battles and 
when we were on campus and I had at least two days a week and I had a good hour and 15 minutes, I, I could do a lot more, but uh, I wanted to give you just a little uh, bit of an insight into what happened to Poland and then what was happening to France and now we're at Dunkirk. Uh, no, the uh, it, Jackson, I think, asked that question. No, they were not out of gas. They were not out of gas. No, plenty of fuel. Mm -hmm. They stopped for other reasons. And I don't have time to get into them or I'll talk for another hour explaining what happened. Yeah. Yeah, so don't let the fuel, that's what everyone thinks. Well, they, it's written in the books. They had plenty of fuel. There's something else going on, and it involves uh, the United States, uh, involves Roosevelt, uh, it involves the monarchy, church, a couple cabinet members, involves Halifax, um, what's going on in Germany other than uh, Hitler, and it involves Mussolini as well. So there's a lot that's going on. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit that next week. All right. Yeah, everybody, I say, 